In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, only once during your earthly life did you ever ask us priests to do something dear to your heart. Only once. Grant that not one of us will refuse. Send thy spirit to inspire us to grant this favor through the merits of your passion, death, and resurrection. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Many of you have made retreats for ten years, fifteen, twenty, maybe thirty or more. Can any one of you remember any resolution that you took during a retreat which you kept? Now look back over the years. Can you think of a single resolve that you kept? The chances are not a single one. And why? Because retreats are like health congresses. There are a series of papers on the necessity of good health, but no specific recommendation is given. So we come to a retreat and we judge the retreat master. He is either good or poor, depending upon the ideas which he gives and the inspiration. But it passes. What are we going to do about a retreat practically? We just simply cannot go back into our own mediocre lives. There are no planes on the spiritual life. We are either going uphill or we are going down. If we are the same as we were last year, we are worse because we have life. And the spiritual life was meant to grow. We get dim intimations of grace and suggestions of spiritual betterment, and then we become indifferent. And as Studdard Kennedy put it in his poem, the indifference of the modern city like Birmingham is more crucifying than the indifference of Calvary. When Jesus came to Golgotha, they nailed him on a tree. They crowned him with a crown of thorns. Red were his wounds and deep. For those were crude and cruel days, and human flesh was cheap. When Jesus came to Birmingham, they only passed him by. They would not hurt a hair of him. They only let him die. For men had grown more tender. They would not give him pain. They only just passed down the street and left him in the rain. And so it rained the winter rain that drenched him through and through and when all the crowds had left the streets without a soul to see, then Jesus crouched against a wall and sighed for Calvary. And in the book of Revelation, St. John describes the seven churches, which may be seven periods of time, which may be seven contemporaneous attitudes of Christian people at all times. But at any rate, here are samples of the decay. Before each church, God says, I know your works. I know what you're doing. I know all your actions. I know your works. Then comes the great but. 
I heard a preacher once, actually. He was talking about the three seminarians who were called by our blessed Lord, and I will follow you, but... And he ended it up by saying, I think a number of people are going to hell on their butts. <clears throat> well, here is the Ephesians, the letter to that church. Fortitude you have, you born up. But I have this against you. You have lost your early love. You've grown cool. Then the church of Sardis. Here there is a disproportion between conduct and belief. So at the beginning of the third chapter, I know all your ways. You have a name for being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and put some strength into what is left, which must otherwise die. And then the church of Laodicea, which I always think is the church, perhaps in this country, because it is the church of wealth. I know all your ways. Then he goes on to describe the wealth. But you are neither hot nor cold. I wish you were. Either hot or cold. I will spit you out of my mouth. You say, how rich am I? How well I've done. I have everything I want. In fact, you do not know that you are the most pitiful, wretched, poor, blind, and naked of all peoples. So there are declensions in the spiritual life, and we're no better after retreats, except we've been entertained, possibly, and that's the end of it. So we go back to our people. And maybe the Lord will complain about us after we've had an opportunity to do something. These lines of Jeremiah in which God speaks are words to be taken to heart. They dress my people's wound, but skin deep only. With their saying, all is well, all well, nothing is well. We have come then to the heart of this retreat. Whether the retreat is good or bad depends upon the response to the proposal I am about to make. I am asking you every single day of your life, without any exception, to make a continuous hour of adoration in the presence of our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. Every single day. The Mass would not be included. When we come to the details of it later, anything else could be included. Now, this is not a devotion. I belong to no association. I recommend none. What I am recommending to you is not a devotion. It's not an option. First of all, our blessed Lord asked us to do it. The word hour has a very specific meaning in the Gospel of John, both for our Lord and for the Blessed Mother. God has his day. The devil has his hour. Seven times the word hour is used in the Gospel of John, and in every single instance it refers to evil. God is outside the power of the Father. He now becomes a pawn in the hands of men. And that word hour is used 
on many occasions. For example, just when he was entering into Jerusalem the last time, he said, Shall I ask my father to be delivered from this hour? It is for this hour that I have come. Three stonings, his hour was not yet come. Tried to throw him over the precipice in the hometown of Nazareth. His hour was not yet come. The night of the Last Supper, when Judas went out the door, he prayed to the Heavenly Father, Father, the hour has come. And then to Judas, this is your hour, your hour in the power of darkness. And all that you can do with it is turn out the lights of the world. So the hour in John, in relation to our Lord, always refers to his combat with evil. But the Blessed Mother has an hour. At Cana, our Blessed Lord said, My hour has not yet come. And then as he drew near to his crucifixion, he used two similes, both in the feminine order. One the hen, and the other the mother who was pregnant, about to give birth. Both of these better indicated the love that he had, the hen gathering the chicks. And mother is in sorrow when her hour of labor has come. Then when the child is born, There's rejoicing. And the Blessed Mother's hour came at the cross when the child, John, was born. So the word hour in John, in relationship to our Lord, refers to evil. With our Blessed Mother, the word hour rather refers to the begetting of the church, the growth, the spread, the health of the mystical body of Christ. So we are therefore asked, for the sake of battling Satan and for the sake of bringing the church once more to spiritual health, to make this hour. Now what are the advantages? What will it do for us? First of all, what will it do for us personally? Well, it will remedy our defects and cure us of any serious fault that we have. We all have a dominant fault, and maybe two or three of them, and we're battling with them all our lives, and to no great success. How is evil to be overcome? Not by combating it directly. St. Paul even suggests that certain kinds of mortification do not do away with certain sins. How do we get rid of evil? by the expulsive power of a new affection. We do not crowd out evil. We do not drive it out, rather, we crowd it out. We drive it out when we attack it directly. We crowd it out when we bring something else in. It's like a man leading an evil life, meeting a fine woman who leads him in the path of virtue. So St. Paul said, Be not overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Our spiritual life must not start, for example, with a deep consciousness of our guilt and sin. No. How do we know, for example, that water is polluted? We know it from clean, clear water. Why are we shocked at bad grammar? Because we know good grammar. Why are we shocked at bad music? Because we know harmonious music. It is Christ that gives us a consciousness of guilt. He is first. Then we become aware of the fact that we perhaps have sinned against him. So one of the first effects of the holy hour will be to get rid 
of any evil that is in our life, somehow or other it just wears away under the radioactivity power of the Holy Eucharist. It is a cobalt treatment for sin. There was a priest who had rather a high office in one diocese. He was thrown out because of, well, principally alcoholism. He went into another diocese and was given grave scandal. And he happened to come into a retreat when I was talking about the holy hour. And he made the holy hour from that time on and died in the presence of the Blessed Sacrament a month or two later. He had been battling drunkenness for years. But here was the expulsive power of a new affection. We fall in love with the Lord. Why do we not have zeal? Simply because we're not in love. Once we're on fire, we'll do anything. We love the Lord, we want to be with him. That'll be the first effect. And the second advantage of the holy hour is we can use it for intercession. Think of how many people there are who say to us, pray for me. I believe that the cruelest word that any priest can say is pray. How many do we ever bring in the presence of our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament to pray with them? Or do we even kneel down in the parlor and pray with them? If we're in parishes, we have the burden of mothers with mongoloid children, wives with unfaithful husbands, girls and boys who are beginning to be addicted families in spiritual distress, partly because of economic distress. All of these are our people. And when they come to us and say, pray for me, we have to do it. And as much as we can, nominatim. And say to the good Lord, I have this person, I have that person. And this intercession helps those who do not pray. Remember the poor paralyzed man who was let down through the roof? He never asked to be brought to our Lord. He never asked to be cured. He certainly never asked to have his sins forgiven. Why was he cured? Why were his sins forgiven? The gospel says because of the prayers of the four men who let him down through the roof. Abraham stopped his gambling with God, 50, 40, 30, 20, 10. But there was no indication that God would have stopped. I read quite often Paul Tournier, the Swiss psychiatrist, who is certainly one of the most Christian psychiatrists in the world. And just Incidentally, in his books on psychiatry, he will mention, I said to the patient, let's kneel down and invoke the grace of God. So to bring people before the Blessed Sacrament, when they come to see us, and pray with them, and a very special prayer. During Lent, the last two years, I've been preaching one week of Lent in St. Bartholomew's Episcopalian Church in New York City. And there was a Filipino woman who I had to stand at the church door and shake hands with everyone in the Protestant fashion. And the Filipino woman said, I have a son who's in the Philippine Islands, and I wish you would try to get him into this country. But she said, I don't want you to mention anything about the Catholic Church to me. I'm mad at the Catholic Church. I only want you to help my son. I said, all right, come to see me tomorrow. Well, I didn't talk about the sun. I said, this is my chapel. You need not kneel, you may stand. And so I said, dear Lord, this woman is mad at you. You're not a good captain. 
She jumped ship, jumped overboard. I'm sure you're not mad at her. And I said, now come back tomorrow and we'll talk about your son. When she came back, I said, let's go to confession first. I heard her confession. The question of the son never came up, actually, after that. And so we have souls at our fingertips. And we intercede for them, and that is what our love of the Eucharist will do, even if they're not with us. And then another reason for making the holy hour. We need power. Power is born of silence and presence. As the psalmist put it, be still and know that I am God. How quickly we are awed by nature, more sensitive to the divine presence. And here we slough off the world that is too much with us. And we come in and spend an hour with the Lord and talk to him and listen and develop our senses of hearing, seeing, touching, hearing, not doing all the talking. Speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. Not listen, Lord, thy servant speaketh. And the Lord does talk to us, seeing. The things that are temporal are seen, says Paul. And we have another vision when we're before the Blessed Sacrament. Remember the priest and the Levite that passed by the wounded man on the road to Jerusalem. They did not want to see him because seeing created responsibility. It will be found, too, that there will be a shrinking from the Blessed Sacrament whenever there is not a good spiritual attitude in the soul, even a mocking, a demeaning of the Eucharist. But when we heighten our spiritual vision, then we're doing something that the apostles had to do. They had to see beyond the veil of the flesh of our Lord in order to comprehend his divinity. And we have to see behind the veil of the species of bread to see his divinity as well. And when we are used to seeing his divinity through the species of bread, then we are more capable of seeing the image of God in people. And finally, touch. Touch is the mark of intimacy. Touch is communion. And there begins to be, after many hours, a presence before the Eucharistic Lord, a deep sense of oneness with Christ. We are even reluctant at the end of many an hour to leave the Lord. Like the disciples of Emmaus, stay with us, Lord. The day is far spent. So, this retreat now is on the line. It's either good or it's no good. The only reason I have other talks about our blessed Lord and about redemption and so forth is to get a concrete practical resolution of an hour. How make it? Well, remember the acrobat who turned somersaults for Our Lady in one of the plays of Victor Hugo. We can do anything. Our office, then we'll really say our office. We can say that. But always, always the scripture. 
Prayer is biblical. On the way to Emmaus, our blessed Lord opened the scriptures to those whom he met on the road, told them about the prophets and David. And bring in a commentary. I recommend only one book, or one set of books, and that is William Barclay's Bible Studies. I think it's in 18 volumes. Small volumes cost about less than half of a fifth of whiskey. There are two volumes on Matthew, one on Mark, one on Luke, two on John, and then the others are on the entire New Testament. Barclay is professor of scripture at the University of Glasgow, I think perhaps a Presbyterian. He knows Latin, he knows Greek, he knows Hebrew, he knows history. And for the busy priest who has to prepare sermons, this is the very best practical book to read. Maybe you'll find here and there something in it that might be shocking, maybe. But I assure you, you'll not find as many shocking things in Barclay as you will in a half a dozen Catholic publications that I could mention. And you will always be enriched by what he reads. And we begin reading scripture until a thought strikes us, and then we drop the book and begin to apply it to ourselves or to others. Now is the hour hard to make only at one period of time, and that is when we're on vacation. At any other time, it's very easy, but when we have all kinds of time, we have no time. When we're under the pressure of a busy life, we get it in. I gave a retreat in Detroit some years ago, and the pastor and the curate were like the Jews and the Samaritans. Neither of them had made the holy hour until 11 o'clock at night. They met one another opening the church door at 11 o'clock at night, and like Pilate and Herod, they became friends. So there are incidental advantages to the holy hour. But let me tell you that what it will do for you is change your life, change your people, change your parish. This is the source of power because it demands faith. Now, I have more power than any of you. When I stand up to talk, people listen to me. And they will follow what I have to say. Is it any power of mine? Of course not. St. Paul says, what have you that you have not received? And if you have received, why do you glory as if you had not? But the secret of my power is the fact that not one single day in 55 years have I missed spending an hour in the presence of our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. That's where the power comes from. That's where sermons are born. That's where every good thought is conceived. Believe me, if you're reading the gospel and the commentary on it six days of a week when you get into the pulpit there will be fire and there will be sparks and the love of God will overflow I don't mean to say that these hours have always been good I've had to walk up and down to church to stay awake I once went into St. Rock's Church in Paris to make an hour and I only had two hours in Paris between trains on my way to Lourdes and there are only about five days a year that I can sleep in the daytime, and this was one. And I sat down at two o'clock, and I slept perfectly until three. And I said to the good Lord, did I make a holy hour? And my angel said, yes, that's the way the apostles made the first one. So it counted, even the sleep. But I tell you, fathers, your life will be transmuted. You'll no longer be the same. And you'll be happy, happy on the inside. I pray every single day of my life that I will drop dead before our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. 
in my 80th year on some feast of Our Lady or some Saturday. I don't know whether the good Lord is going to do it for me or not. But I do know that after having asked him all of these years, if he doesn't do it, he's going to be mighty embarrassed when he meets me.